From Chicago's Can TV, a look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. Well, hi there. Welcome to the show. It's Chicago Newsroom with Ken Davis here on Can TV. So the midterm elections are underway, and by Tuesday you will hopefully have voted. We hope you will. But we're not uh, going to talk too much about the elections today because presumably you've already decided. Are you for Pat or Bruce or Durbin or Oberweiss or Judy or Sheila and so on? And for us here in Cook County, are you going to retain Preckwinkle, Dart, Pappas, Berrios, or... Well, as we said, you already know. You already know how you're going to vote, or you may already have voted, so we're not going to persuade you anyway, either way today. But instead, what we want to talk about is a really important issue that's facing Illinois that really has not been talked about much in this election. The fact that hydraulic fracturing for oil and natural gas is about to get underway big time in our state. Now, Bruce Rauner, Jim Oberweiss, they favor it enthusiastically. Durbin said last night that he's uh, more cautious about it. Governor Quinn obviously favors it because he signed the legislation legislation authorizing it, but he said he wants to see strict regulations before any permits are issued. So by some accounts, there are landowners and leaseholders and drillers and energy companies that are just raring to go and threatening lawsuits if the state doesn't start issuing permits pretty soon. And the state, for its part, says that the rules should be in place in just about a couple of weeks, maybe. But we're going to find out all the details about that. So what is going on? A couple of weeks ago, we heard from people who adamantly oppose fracking, or at least want it severely regulated, and we told you at the time that we would kind of hear the other side today, and our guest today says it is time to get started, and that's Mark Denzler, who's with the Illinois Manufacturers Association. Mark, it's great to have you on the show. Ken, Thanks. thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Also join us today, uh, Julie Wernow, who's with the Tribune, writes on, you write on energy issues and stuff like that, and she's uh, covered this development for months, written uh, last week at a really good piece about Southern Illinoisans who are getting pretty ticked <laughs> off about all the delays and... 600 people at a church uh, yelling, we want fracking to begin. So we're a big state, we're a complicated state. There are very different opinions from one place to another in, in the state of Illinois, and you've been covering that and lots of other things. So glad to have you here. Glad so to be here. maybe we could begin with some things that we can just all agree are factual. The state of Illinois, it is legal today to frack in Illinois, right? I mean, I could go out and frack, except I just couldn't get a permit to do it. <laughs> Cor correct, Ken. Thanks for having me. And Julie and I have done this a couple times. Um, so I hear you guys are like a kind of a, a, uh, we're a, a traveling team. road show. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so fracturing has actually been occurring in the state for more than 70 years. Uh, most people are familiar with conventional fracturing. When you drive around Southern Illinois, you saw the little uh, oil um, derricks that are in the field, and they run depending on the price of oil. So we've been fracturing in the state again for 70 years. We used to be a top five producer uh, in the United States. And what's changed is the advent of the new high volume hydraulic fracturing. that's kind of taken the nation by rage over the last 12 or 15 years. And today there's more than three dozen states across the country that are fracturing California, you know, Oklahoma, Texas, uh, North Dakota. And so the um, high volume of hydraulic fracturing just allows you to reach deposits of oil and gas that previously you couldn't reach. Okay, we'll, we'll get into, into that. But what I was, just to, to, to back up a little bit, it, it, the, the law was passed that authorizes fracking in Illinois. But then came the tough part, which is that every law has to have, what, rules, right? That's right. Like uh, rules that allow the law to be carried out. How do you do the permitting? When do you do this? When do you do that? And that's where the complication has come in, as I understand it. Well, um, again, as I often say on this show, pretty much everything I know about <laughs> this, I know from reading you. So, <laughs> so I'm asking you questions yes. about things that you've written already. Yeah, I mean, that's right. So, so the law actually passed, you know, a year and a half ago. But what, what happens is then, you know, the, the legislature says, okay, take that law and uh, we're gonna give it to the Illinois Department of Natural Resources and they're gonna turn it into rules and regulations so that they can actually start issuing permits for fracking. Um, but that process has been a lengthy process. Um, they have to uh, hold hearings, they had to create a, a draft of the rules and then people responded to the rules. So they commented, they got thousands and thousands of comments more than they ever have on any rules that they've ever created. Mm -hmm. 
And so then they had to come back with the second draft and say, okay, uh, here's what we think the rules should be after listening to everybody. Um, and then the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules is supposed to uh, approve it or ask for changes or just reject them outright. Um, and so we're waiting on this committee to, to decide. And they have until November? Technically 15th? November 15th. Um, but but they're not meeting after, what is it, November 6th is when they're Correct. going to meet. So uh, if they don't decide on November 6th, this whole process is going to start all over again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, oh, that must really, that must really <laughs> excite the Illinois <laughs> Manufacturers well, Association. Well, you know, and it does. In, in the IMA and the Grow Coalition, which consists of, you know, several dozen organizations, including the AFL-CIO and the Railroad Association, the State Chamber of Commerce, Farm Bureau and others worked together for three years to get the law. And as Julie said, we're now in the rulemaking process. Uh, today's an anniversary, not one that we celebrate, but it's been 500 days since uh, the law was signed. We've yet to see the final set of rules. Um, and we'll see, we're working through the process, the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules, which is a bipartisan, bicameral group, three members from each of the four caucuses, is um, really uh, kind of taken a step back and said, look, we're gonna review this. Um, we think that the rules should meet the statute, they shouldn't go further, and they also shouldn't weaken the statute. And that's the position that the IMA has taken in the Grow Coalition. We want the statute implemented. We want to make sure that we have strong protections for the air, the water, and the ground while you allow the industry to develop. So we're hopeful that the rules get approved November 6th and that fracturing can begin occurring. Well, it's interesting because we had a representative here from um, the Nat Natural Resources Defense Council, and she said exactly the same thing. Mm. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just, we the rule, the law is the law, and uh, we just want to make sure it doesn't go any further or, 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 mm. any, or weaken it in any way. So. Um, if it's taken 500 days, then there must be some disagreement here uh, beyond, it must go beyond just, we just want these rules to be fair. And what I understand is that uh, there have been a number of really contentious issues that have had all of you guys around the table for a long time. I mean, uh, just things like the disclosure of the chemicals that get put into the ground, uh, the potential for water pollution, um, uh, storage of, of materials. I mean, what we, I guess what we need to do is we do need to, I, I have this weird feeling that, that a lot of people have, who were with us a few minutes <laughs> ago have already kind of <laughs> drifted off because we're not really um, focusing on what this is. As you said, there's been oil drilling for a long time, but this is a new industrial grade kind of drilling that involves pushing stuff into the ground to get the oil out. And that is sand and gravel and chemicals and water and all sorts of stuff to like kind of fracture the rock down below, right? I mean, I think that's correct. Yeah, you're okay. going so thousands <coughs> of feet below, you know, the surface, mm -hmm. there's this, these oil deposits. Right, right. And so what, what they used to do, right, is you just go down vertically mm -hmm. and get the oil out that way. Well, now they go, well, how about we just go down vertically, look at that that whole layer mm -hmm. and just go horizontal and mm -hmm. frack the whole way. Right, right. And so it's, it's that's why it's a yeah, lot yeah. more oil. It, and you're right, it, it's used frack fluid, which is a combination of water and sand and chemicals. And it's actually only one half of 1% uh, are, are sand or chemicals. The vast majority is water. Um, they open small fissures underground and then the oil or gas pools to the well site and then they're able to, to but extract But I understand that, that Illinois fracturing is not gonna use a lot of water because that, that's what I thought I just read, that, that it's, it's gonna be more like gels and chemicals because water isn't effective in the Illinois and New Albany, is that? Is no, that no, not, not at all, actually, that's false. They're gonna be used largely um, water. There are some technologies where they're looking at using, for example, a nitrogen frack. Um, really, until the geologists get down there and you start exploring and discovering, you'll have to figure out the combination of what you use, but no, generally, they're gonna use water uh, for fracks. Mm -hmm. There was, there, were, there was a, I think what you're referring to is there was a report uh, a few years ago, this was like 800 page study of the shale formation here. And in that report, the scientists did say that they didn't think that water would be ideal, that, that, that using gel or some kind of uh, gas frack would make more sense. Mm -hmm. um, but Mark's also right in that, I think there's a lot of unknowns still. Mm -hmm. We're waiting for these yeah, yeah. Uh, drillers to go down there and see what they find right. and what method works best. So. As I told you, Mark, before we went on the air, I, I 
count myself as a skeptic when it mm -hmm. comes to this process. And, and the reason that I'm a skeptic is because I just imagine if we were doing this show in 1953 and we were talking with people who were talking about this miracle new DDT <laughs> or, or you know, PCBs. The PCBs are so mm. miraculous that you could drink them. They're, and, they, and they're great lubricants. They, everything works fine. And when you're finished with them, you can just dump them in the lake because they're completely inert. And then, of course, we find out otherwise. And this is one of those things that really strikes me as being like that, 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 that our grandchildren will be sitting here at this table 40 years from now saying, what were they thinking? They injected all of this chemical into the ground. They polluted millions of gallons of water. They ruined the water table for all time. And they got a few years of oil out of the ground. What was the point? Well, I, actually, that's a great segue. And I, I'm glad that you brought up the point of drinking. Um, because Governor uh, John Hickenlooper, who is a Democrat in Colorado and a geologist of all things, um, actually drinks glasses of frac fluid. He's done it in front of the press to show that most frac fluid now, the chemicals are food grade safe. And so, you know, if you want to go well, we'll YouTube, check in you, with him you in can find years. Governor Higginlooper. Um, but again, companies are using technology and it's improving on a daily basis. And, and there's certainly been some horror stories out there uh, that largely uh, have been proven false. For example, water lighting on fire was the famous scene in the movie. And uh, the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission, their equivalent of the Department of Natural Resources, looked at it and found that it was geothermic methane. It had been um, the breakdown of organic materials. And people in that area had been lighting their water on fire for 100 years. I would note there's three towns in the United States called Burning Springs because their water is lit on fire, not because of hydraulic fracturing. So we think that there are safeguards in place. And I'd also note with the Illinois legislation that John Bradley was the, the chief sponsor. And he said at the beginning of every meeting, we want to make sure we protect the air, water, and land because he lives there, his family lives there. So that was always the guiding principle. And the other thing I think uh, that you find historic about the Illinois law was the first time the environmental community supported the law. So the folks like the Sierra Club and Natural Resource Defense Council, Illinois Environmental Council, uh, Governor Quinn, Attorney General Madigan, all participated and they all signed off on the bill because it has the strongest environmental protections. And so we want to make sure from an industry standpoint that we are certainly protecting the air, water, and ground. We, there's a lot of protections in the bill that we think uh, makes sense for Illinois. Let me, I, just forgive me if I'm just jumping around <coughs> here because we just have so little time to do all these things, but. What's going to happen in Illinois with the natural gas? Are you just burn it off? The natural gas that you bring out? Yeah, or natural gas comes with, with fracking, right? I mean, well, it, it, so your well can either be, you might find natural gas, you might find oil. I think most geologists believe in the New Albany Shale, which for your listeners is in southeast Illinois, um, you know, kind of um, uh, Wayne County is the epicenter of it. And so you will, um, most folks believe it's going to be a primarily oil play. Uh, but you will get some uh, other gases, methane, you might get some natural gas. Some of it can be flared off. If there's enough that they can recover it, they'll certainly recover it and they'll store it if they can. Yeah, so. I, I was just going to say, um, you know, and that's that's sort of part of the issue uh, for, I think, the environmental groups that were, um, there's some anti-fracking groups, which are, I would I would say, are different than the environmental groups. And mm -hmm. because for yeah, them, it's not just what goes down, right? Mm -hmm. You know, with all respect right. to the drinking of the flac fracking fluid. Mm -hmm. I mean, once that goes down there, it's coming, it comes back up with, you know, with things that are naturally occurring right, elements right. underground, like radiation, for mm -hmm. instance. And that, that scares a lot of people mm -hmm. um, to think that that could be showing up. Um, Mm -hmm. I think uh, there's some misinformation out there. People think that a lot of water contamination happens from the fracking process. Mm -hmm. Actually, it has a lot more to do with um, what happens when the, with the fluid that comes back up. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if it's sitting, for instance, in open pits or something, and there's a big mm -hmm. rainstorm, that's how groundwater that's water a big can issue get is storage, right? Exactly. So, right. so that was a huge uh, part of the law was mm -hmm. that was negotiated was this idea of we can't be storing this stuff in open pits. We have to have it covered, contained. Um, it, Illinois sort of was able to learn a lot from the mistakes of other states that have done this. And that's, you know, the hope, I guess, is that, mm -hmm. you know, that, that they're going to be able to do a better job mm -hmm. and not just mm -hmm. learn from their mistakes as they go. And I think that's a really important issue that um, there is a benefit to not being first when it comes to something mm -hmm. like this because we've seen horrific things happening in other places that maybe Illinois can learn from. But I, I raise this question about the gas because um, I think we've probably all seen those satellite pictures of North Dakota at night. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is just, it's just stunning to see that there's, a, there's an area practically the size of Chicago that is as bright on the satellite as Chicago. And this is in the middle of absolutely nowhere because 
as they're as they're drilling for oil, they're getting all of this natural gas, and it's just. They're just so mad about getting the oil out of the ground that this natural resource, this important natural resource, enough of it to heat a couple of cities, they're just burning it into the air. Well, and I, I, I just got to tell you, I find that, I just find that repugnant. I really do. Well, I, first of all, I would say that no company wants to flare the gas if they don't have to. Um, and second of all, one of the protections we put in for flaring, there's not an automatic given for flaring. If a company wants to flare their gas, they have to get a special exemption from the Department of Natural Resources. And um, the requirements in the law and the rules are going to say it has to be essentially energy efficient in terms of, you know, you're not going to flare 100% natural gas. You're going to capture a lot of the CO2, the sulfur, and the emissions that come out of that, first of all. And the second thing I would point out on natural gas is, you know, natural gas burns twice as clean as coal, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have folks so that, that don't like coal, and, and if you burn natural gas as mm -hmm. opposed to coal and you use it as your uh, primary energy source, you're reducing emissions significantly that way. So I think you yeah. have to look at the entire picture of it yeah. as well. Well, that's, that's, that's exactly my point, is that, is that this, is a, this is a valuable resource that is being just destroyed in this mad dash to get as much out of the ground as we possibly can, as fast as we can. And I gotta tell you, I just don't understand that. I mean, that, that's the part that is objectionable to me. I, I spent some time last year up in the Pacific Northwest and, uh, you know, I, I have been a Redwood fan all my life and wanted to get up there and see my Redwoods. Mm -hmm. And that's when I learned something that I had not understood before about the Pacific Lumber Company that had been in, in business for 150 years. And you can argue, everyone argues all the time about this stuff, whether it was sustainable or not. But, you know, they were cutting Redwoods down, but they were... And then all of a sudden the company gets sold to some Wall Street outfit called Maxam and within... Ten years, they clear cut that sucker down to the ground, and they just wiped that resource off the face of the earth. And there was no market for the redwood, so they were shipping it to China and using it for sh for shipping crates and toothpicks and stuff. Those people needed to be incarcerated. That was that was a crime against nature. It was a crime against each and every one of us. We lost a huge natural resource for no reason, and this is not on that scale. But it is the same thing. It's like. Why do we have to? Why do we have to go in and maximize profit to get it out of the ground as fast as we possibly can? Why can't we be reasonable about it and do it in a rational way so that we get all the resources out instead of this gold rush kind of attitude? Well, I think you are trying to maximize it. I mean, again, you know, this has been going on for 15 years, and you know, you have lights in the studio, and you want to be able to come to the studio, flip the switch, and make Absolutely. sure you have the lights or the Absolutely. TV at home. I, um, I totally and, get that. You know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, you can remember when folks said the United States was going to run out of coal, yeah. natural gas, oil. Yeah. You know, today we're going to we're poised to become we're right on the cusp of being the leading producer of both oil and natural gas. And uh, as much as we support using renewable resources of energy nuclear, coal, what have you, renewable resources are only 4%. So you're going to have to have an energy source. Uh, natural gas is, has created thousands of jobs. It's resulted in low cost of energy uh, for businesses, for residential consumers. It's reduced our reliance on foreign sources of energy. Uh, it's made the United States less susceptible to hurricanes that come through the Gulf, for example. And again, getting back to the Illinois legislation, as Julie said, we've learned a lot from what other states have done. And so we have the strongest regulations in the country. And again, that's the reason that the mainstream environmental community signed off on the bill is exactly that, to make sure we have strong environmental protections in Illinois. And one of, one of the things you, you have to realize in all of this, right, is whenever you hear somebody say, well, you know, this is the way it's going to be, right? We're going to run out of coal or this and that. I mean, what we're talking about here is this vast change has to do with the technology change, right? Mm -hmm. And right, so everything right, you're hearing today, right. like, oh, we're going to have, you know, natural gas for 100 years, mm -hmm. all that can change in a minute as soon mm -hmm. as you build an amazing battery, right, oh, that right. can turn, right. you know, that can right. store tons of right. energy. So you never really know what's going to happen. And at the same time, the issue is the, the even the price of oil, right? Right now the price of oil is going down. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you could see all these people walk away if the right. price of oil gets right. to be right. too right. low. Well, actually, Julie, that's that's one of the, the other questions that I wanted to raise here today because you've written, and I, I think you've said, Mark, that, that a lot of the, the drilling companies, the oil companies, are willing, are just ready to walk out of Illinois because they're so ticked off about mm -hmm. these regulations and how strenuous they are and they can't, they can't make it profitable, so they're going to just walk away from Illinois. To which I would say, 
that doesn't have anything to do with the fact that the oil, oil prices are coming down and maybe they're just saying, you know what, let's just sit on Illinois for a few years. We'll get back to it when the prices come back up. Isn't that what's really going on? No, not at all. Um, the folks in Illinois are looking at the law, which is the strictest in the country bar none. They've looked at the rules that have been proposed by the Department of Natural Resources. They went far above and beyond what was intended in the statute or the negotiations. I'm happy to point out specifics. Um, the oil companies have limited resources. They have limited capital investment in where to locate. So they make decisions every day. Do they come to Illinois? Do they come to Indiana, Texas, Oklahoma, you name it? They've looked at Illinois and you know it's gonna take a company seven to eight years just to recoup their investment. And, and when you talk about a well, many people don't think about it. They think, hey, it's you know, somebody goes in their backyard and drills for oil. No, and as Julie said, you're going down six, eight, ten thousand feet. A well costs probably six, eight, ten million dollars each. Um, so it's going to take companies a long time to recover, and you don't just put in one well. You know, you're going to put in a number of wells, and so companies make decisions. Whether you're in the oil business, or you're in manufacturing, or you're in retail, um, they look at a number of decisions. Now, certainly the price of oil coming down could play a role, but that hasn't, you know, that's just happened in the last week or two, mm -hmm. well before these companies have started maybe looking elsewhere. I mean, I think the, I think the, um, the change that, fracking has brought to our economy is just is is dramatic. I mean it's something that, that we will look back in fifty years and say this was this was a moment when the country pivoted mm -hmm. and, and everything changed. Uh, we've talked on the show here about you know the coal plants, the closing of the coal plants in Chicago and a lot of community groups have taken, you know, they've taken their victory laps because they closed these plants and it's like no, you didn't. You didn't close those plants. Fracking closed those mm -hmm. plants because the, the companies just realized it was cheaper to just mm -hmm. abandon these plants and build gas plants. Mm -hmm. That's what really happened. And yes, I drove here today and I heat my house and I need energy like everybody else does. So I'm not, uh, as I said, I, I'm in the category of skeptic here. Mm -hmm. I, I'm somebody who says, yes, I understand this. And I think that, I think that what fracking has brought us is by and large a good thing. But you know it is connected into the into the global economy. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know this idea that it's bringing down our gas prices. Well, partly it's bringing down our gas prices because it isn't all that practical yet to get this stuff on the pipeline to send it to China, which is mm -hmm. what the oil companies would really like to do with our mm -hmm. fracked oil, right? They want they want to get the price up. They want to sell it on the global market. Well, sure, they love to have markets, and it's interesting when you talk about the cost and why companies are leaving. When you had your program here a couple of weeks ago and the representative from NRDC toward the end made the comment, well, we not necessarily like fracking, but you know, if we can make it so expensive so the companies don't come, that's what we've tried to do. And so, again, to your point, some of the things that they have pushed for in the rules that go beyond the statute are intentionally designed to try to stop the industry in Illinois. Um, but sure, companies want to make a profit. Companies uh, want to sell their product, whether you're a manufacturing company or your agriculture. Uh, you look for customers around the world. But what it's done for the United States, if you look back in the last five years uh, under the president's administration, all the job growth, almost 100% of it comes from the energy sector. The increased jobs, increased right. revenue. So what it's done to this country over the last five or 10 years has been significant. I mean, you look at North Dakota, you know, I wish Illinois was that situation. They have $4 billion in reserves in the bank and the lowest unemployment rate in the country. I mean, I'd love to see yeah, that. Yeah, but Illinois. I mean, come on, it's, it's a state with almost no population. It's, it, it's not quite the same thing, is it? A absolutely it is. I mean, they have an extremely low unemployment rate. Their McDonald's now are starting pay at twenty or twenty-two dollars yeah, an hour. They have with to a fly people bonus. to work at Menards. You know, they have to fly we, them we in. We sit here. I mean, we yeah. sit here talking about minimum wage here. I'd love to increase the minimum wage because supply and demand. Because you don't have enough workers to fill the jobs. I mean, w we need jobs in the state of Illinois. We need revenue. Uh, this is a safe and proven technology. Uh, in, in the Illinois law, by far, is the strictest in the country. I mean, be beyond North Dakota and Illinois, you have to look at. I mean, you can't overstate the ripple effects that fracking has had. So, just for instance, if you th if you look look at uh, electric vehicle adoption, hybrid vehicle adoption. Well, people started going toward that technology in droves because if you remember, gas prices yeah. used to be pretty yeah. high. Yeah. Um, and so one of the concerns I think for some policymakers is, okay, all this cheap energy, cheap oil, cheap natural gas, what does that do to some of our other goals as a nation? Mm -hmm. Are we going right. to stop people from Just kind of puts this? it on the shelf for a while, doesn't it? So Mark, can you tell me and our listeners and Julie that you are sitting here today and you believe that horizontal fracturing is not harmful to the environment? Yes, 100%. And 100%, it, not even 99%. You're, you're always going to have issues 
no matter what industry and whether you're a firefighter a police officer or in the oil business you know accidents do occur no doubt about it but when you look back at folks that have studied this and so don't take my opinion look at lisa jackson who is the epa minister for president obama said this can be done safe um as we talked before the show dick durbin was in his debate last night on wttw they were asked about fracturing he said he's talked to the last two secretaries of energy including stephen chu who's a nobel prize winner who said it can be done safely so um, you know, folks like Dick Durbin and President Obama's Secretary of Energy and EPA are not necessarily always friendly to industry. And when they're out saying this can be done safely, uh, it certainly can be done if the proper safeguards and protections are taken. And we've done that in Illinois. Julie talked, for example, about the closed loop system for water as opposed to using pit. We agreed to that. We agreed to a historic uh, uh, provision in law that nowhere else in the country that if there is an incident in the state of Illinois, Instead of making, for example, the landowner or the person that owns the well prove that the company caused the problem, it's automatically presumed that the company caused it unless they can prove otherwise. Within so, 1,500 feet So or the something. industry has, has taken the lead and said, look, we're going to be presumed guilty unless we can prove we're innocent. Where else do you find that? So we got a couple of minutes left. Where, where, do we, where does it go from here? There is a, there is a lawsuit. There is a lawsuit, yeah, in, in Wayne County and, and the, I talked to the lawyer just this past week uh, who's responsible for that lawsuit and he says that they are going to sort of proliferate that in other counties where landowners are waiting for fracking to begin. Um, so we could see several lawsuits in our hands fairly shortly over this perceived delay um, in fracking getting started. So that's sort of the next, that's the next step. But if the, if it does get put in place, if the rules do get put in place by the 15th, they'll probably be issuing permits on the 16th, I think, or maybe late in the day on the 15th. No. 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 Yeah, it, it takes some time. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a whole process. Uh, there's actually, you know, one of the things that the environmental groups fought for in particular is that they'd be able to have public hearings over these permits. And so you're going to see, oh, that's right. definitely going to see some yeah. public yeah. hearings. Yeah, yeah. so yes. a, a company has to register. They have to register for 30 days before they can apply for a permit. DNR has 60 days in which to issue a permit. And during that time, you'll have public hearing, public comments, and, and the like. So, yeah, if, if the rules come out on November 6th, you're not going to see permits. But on these November public 7th. hearings are going to be in Wayne County, so it's not going to exactly be uh, that contentious, is it? It, well, that's actually part of the issue right now oh. with the rules, um, because what the, what the uh, one of the big issues of contention is people are concerned that um, that just about anybody could show up and decide that this impacts right. their right. land, right? right? If they like to kayak in the area, that mm -hmm. it could impact their land. So that's on the industry side, that's been a big concern, and on the environmental group side, they don't want someone have to show you know 100 years worth of mm -hmm. you know land ownership in order to say, hey, right, I don't right. want, they I don't want, support yeah, fracking yeah, in my yeah, county, yeah. and so busloads of people from Chicago mm -hmm. going. To, and, well, and, can I, and I would we point have like you, 10 seconds. Mark, okay, it, when you talk about the 30,000 comments, one thing you meant, that was just done by less than 1,000 people submitting comments every day. Yeah. So, so keep that in mind. Well, you well. see that in, every, in everything. I mean, it's like whenever there's a big uh, issue with public comment, it's the cut and paste, uh, right. uh, hit the button. And, Correct. Yeah. Okay. Mark Denzer, thank you so much for being with us today. I really enjoyed thank talking you. to you. I appreciate with you. it. Mark Denzer from the uh, Onai Manufacturers Association. And Julie Wernoff, first time on the show. Glad to have you. And I hope you'll be Thanks back many, me. many more times to sure talk thing. about all your stories. She's with the Chicago Tribune. And you have been watching Chicago Newsroom. It's a community service of Can TV. You can see us here all the time. But this is the place to go. This address right here you see on your screen, that's where you can watch us any old time you want. Or you can listen to us on iTunes. And we will be back again next week, I promise, or threat, whichever you prefer. We'll see you next week. I'm Ken Davis. Thanks. Bye.